Welcome to the Great Marsh. My name is Peter Fippen. I'm a coastal scientist for the Mass Bays National Estuary Program and the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Um, I'm standing here with my colleague Robert Buxbaum. I'm Robert, Robert Buxbaum. I'm a conservation scientist with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Robert, we're in a, uh, a fairly diverse brackish marsh here, um, a healthy marsh one might term. Can you talk a little bit about the diversity of this marsh? Yeah, this marsh is, um, has a lot more different kinds of plants than we would find further downstream, like in the, the shores surrounding Plum Island Sound. It's a river and came to the Mill River, which is a major tributary of the Parker. And as you go further upstream, um, the water becomes fresher because we're getting more of an influence from the land. Uh, and more plants can tolerate fresh water uh, than can tolerate salt water. So as you get more and more fresher, uh, the, uh, the amount of plants that you can actually live here becomes greater. So we might expect as we're down there, maybe, uh, maybe uh, in a small area, you might expect only a couple of species. Sometimes it's just one species. Here we're seeing that these brackish habitats, less saline habitats, are very susceptible to the invasion of uh, Phragmites, the common reed. Does that affect the uh, bird life? You're, uh, uh, I'm with the Audubon Society. Uh, yes. Uh, the problem with Phragmites is that it, it pushes everything else out. So ultimately, in, in many Phragmites areas, um, you have nothing else but Phragmites there. And the types of birds that use that, particularly some of the rarer species, don't particularly like those Phragmites habitats. Uh, and so uh, generally wildlife managers uh, try to manage to prevent Phragmites invasions or to uh, reduce them when they can uh, through ver various methods. We have, as you know, we have a number of projects in the Great Marsh, the plants that we wouldn't expect. Talk about some of those plants right now. Um, what do you see here? Well, right here we've got, just even standing here within a few feet of ourselves, we've got a bunch of different things. Right uh, at my feet here, there's something called black grass, which is actually a kind of a rush and it has these uh, seed heads, which you can see, which are right now turning pretty rusty reddish brown at flowers in May or June, early in the season. So it provides food for waterfowl, uh, geese, and ducks earlier in the year than, uh, than a lot of other uh, types of plants. This ditch here, uh, another group of plants I see, this uh, iva and some water hemp and a few other things. Why do you think those are focused along the, the little creek. That, the, the little ditch we're seeing is actually a legacy from the mosquito ditching mm -hmm. that went on in this, these marshes. Uh, a lot of it in the 1930s, which was uh, done as uh, from the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression, uh, when a lot of our marshes would ditch, something like 95% of our marshes were, uh, in Massachusetts, were ditched. Um, and when they would ditch the marsh, they would actually pile the marsh spoils along the edge of the, the mar of the ditch. And that would create a, like a levee of slightly higher elevation. And when you're talking marshes elevation and plant tolerances, you're only talking a few inches that can yes. make a big difference. The water hemp and the, uh, the uh, marsh elder, uh, the shrub, are, are an indicator of that. And if we were up in an airplane, we might see these marsh ditches. Birds, um, Birds make use of a lot of different marsh habitats around here. That's one thing we're actually studying. Um, Plum Island Sound is part of a long-term ecological research uh, and the different components of the marsh. And so uh, my role in this project is to look at birds and I also do some work on vegetation. So the birds make use of a variety of different habitats on the marsh. I think we saw as we were coming here along the upper edge of the marsh, we saw a lot of greater yellow legs which are resting now because the tide was high and they'll, like a lot of shorebirds, will make use of the tidal flats at, uh, when, the tidal, when the tide drops. Um, we also saw egrets and the egrets make use of uh, the pans. During high tide they'll actually come out and uh, feed on the fish that swim out over to the, on the marsh surface as the marsh is flooded at high tide. Um, and they also like feeding along the, the, the tidal flats in, in the rivulets and creeks. Absence of invasives in this spot. Mm -hmm. And we see along the edge, as you can see, little patches of Phragmites, the common reed. And 
that's an invasive species which is we're attempting to manage, and I know you're involved in some of those mm -hmm. uh, projects uh, more than me, more than I am. Uh, but from the bird perspective, getting back to the original question you asked, that's a that's a uh, habitat that's considered by most everyone who's looked into it not to be as v valuable for birds and other wildlife. So the fact that we have a nice diverse marsh and this fragmites free fragmites free. Is, is a good thing for pretty much pretty much everything. Um, there are specific birds that like brackish marshes more than the saltier parts of it, and it's one thing we're always looking for as we're investigating as we go further up these rivers um, to see if some of those species, a number of them are rare and endangered species in Massachusetts, things like certain rails, uh, sedge wrens, um, bitterns, which seem to like the uh, the less salty parts of the marsh or prefer that and uh, that's something we haven't looked into as much uh, and I know people have done some surveys uh, but it's sort of an open question of whether this type of habitat st is still supports those birds. Bro those birds are rare for other reasons besides the absence of habitat because this to me looks like wonderful habitat for them. Great. Well thanks a lot Robert. Appreciate your time. <laughs>